the best of days to you. Thank you for watching this video. Let me introduce quickly the two stories that I will be reading to you. The first one is called Memoirs from a Nursing Home. A very interesting story about uh, a doctor who is, let's say, not all he seems. The second is called The Will of the Fates. A very nice story set in a mythical land. I think you'll enjoy both of these stories, and I, I hope you enjoy the video. So sit back, relax, and let's listen to a couple creepy stories. In my younger days, I used to work in a nursing home, which is kind of ironic given the circumstances. Do I feel old enough to be in a nursing home? Of course not. Nobody ever really feels old. But when I see people look at me like a carton of expired milk, I know that old is exactly what I am. Agnes Conley, the old maid. The doctor tells me that I'm starting to develop Alzheimer's, and I feel like I'm supposed to put some kind of positive spin on that. Like I'm supposed to tell people that, despite the bleak prognosis, somehow, I've come to terms with my future and found inner peace. Yeah, right. That kind of feel-good nonsense only happens on the Hallmark Channel. Mostly, I spend my time sitting around thinking about what's going to happen, how it's all going to end. What scares me isn't that the disease will eventually kill me, which it will, but that it's going to take away my memories first. My nurse always tells me, Agnes, at least you've had a good run at it. You've lived a long life. Can you really ask for more than that? But will it even matter? If this sickness festering inside of me takes away my memories, will I even know that I've had a good run at it? Without my memories, will I even really be Agnes anymore? That's why I need to tell my story. That's why I need to explain what I saw happen. Because if I don't tell it right now, I don't think I ever will. So I'm writing it down now before I forget. Somebody needs to know what happened to those poor people. It all started when I was 25. For the sake of full disclosure, I should probably come right out and tell you that I was a recovering drug addict at the time. I had spent a couple of years bouncing around from city to city on the charity of family members until I'd inevitably wear out my welcome. And then it would be on to the next place. I'm not proud of that period of my life, and I did a lot of despicable things, but it's my burden to bear, and I live with it. Eventually, I managed to stay clean long enough to finish up nursing school and land a job at the Iroquois Center for Senior Care. Many of the patients were still relatively independent and didn't require much support, but some of them had deteriorated to the point that they relied on the medical staff for practically everything. My responsibilities ranged from administering medication to even helping patients bathe. To be honest, I didn't enjoy it very much. Most of the seniors were pretty senile, and some of them couldn't even hold a conversation with me. It wasn't very glamorous, but it was the only job I could hold down at the time. One day I had been giving one of the patients, Peggy, I think her name was, a bath. That was the day that everything changed for me. I was rinsing her hair when she suddenly looked up at me with an expression of excitement. Did you see that man that came in earlier? She asked. Who are you talking about? I responded. She looked ahead while I finished washing her hair. He was quite handsome. Young wasn't the word I would have used to describe him, at least at that point in my life. The first time I laid eyes on him, I probably would have put him in his early 60s. Funny how I ever thought that 60 could be old. I'd eat my own children just to feel that young again. Allow me to introduce myself, he said. My name is Dr. Brandt. I'll be taking over for Dr. Mitchell. I shook his outstretched hand. I'm Agnes. It's a pleasure to meet you, I said. He winked at me. The pleasure is mine. I would not have called Dr. Brandt attractive either. Certainly, in his younger years, he must have been handsome. But his best days were behind him. His hair, mostly gray and neatly trimmed, 
only had a couple black strands left over. His irises, which were a violent shade of gray, swirled around like storm clouds. Are you familiar with Sue Clary? He asked me. Yeah, of course. She's one of the patients in the hospice wing, I answered. Dr. Brandt scanned his clipboard distractedly. I see she's being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. It's obviously quite advanced. Uh, that's right, I said. It's awful to see her go through it. I checked in on her earlier, and I don't think she's got very long. I'm going to increase her morphine prescription. He paused, looking up from his clipboard. Can you start including that with the rest of her medications this morning? He asked. Of course, I responded. I won't forget. Good. Later that morning, I rolled the medicine cart into Sue's room. Another nurse, Nancy, was with me and we were making our rounds together. Good morning, Sue, I said, glancing at my patient. Nancy looked at me somberly. She looks like she already has one foot in the grave, Nancy whispered. Judging by Sue's colorless complexion and the feverish twitch in her eyes, Nancy seemed to be right. Just do what we need to do, I said. Can you fix her pillow? Nancy nodded in agreement. Sue, I'm just going to get your medication together, all right? I declared. Sue only moaned back. I took out a Dixie cup and started gathering various pills together until something stopped me in my tracks. I took a sharp breath and made a fist. My old nemesis was back, this time in the form of a morphine bottle. Tension bubbled up inside my chest. I looked at Nancy and then back at the bottle. Nancy was busy taking notes as I held the morphine in my hands. I knew that it was already too late. Uh, Nancy, I said. What was that patient's name in C2, the diabetic one? Roger, you mean? Yeah, that's the one. You said his blood sugar was high yesterday, didn't you? Yeah, we tested him last night, she said. Why don't you go check on him, I suggested. I can take it from here. Nancy hesitated. It's all right, I can finish up, I reassured her. Well, okay, she said. Before she left, Nancy peeked her head back in. Agnes? she asked. Yeah, I jumped. Want to go out for lunch later? Sure, I told her. Nancy seemed satisfied with this, and I waited until I heard her footsteps die away. With one swift motion, I scooped the morphine out of Sue's cup and stuck the pills inside my pocket. In a couple of weeks' time, it wouldn't make a difference anyways. First thing the following morning, I went to check on Sue. As I strode into her room, I realized something was wrong. Sue's bed was empty. Dr. Brandt was standing at the bedside deep in thought. Dr. Brandt, I asked. What's going on? He whirled around and looked me up and down. Agnes, he said. Good morning. For a second I could have sworn that his eyes smoldered red. Where's Sue? He paused. She passed away last night. I was shocked. Sue was sick, but I never thought that she would be gone this soon. I assumed she had a couple weeks left at least. Well, when it's your time, it's your time, he mused. Yeah, yeah, I, I guess you're right, I said casually. But at least, he continued, we did everything we could to make her feel comfortable at the end. I'll try to remind myself that, I said. Something about Dr. Brandt seemed subtly changed. His hair was still gray, but less so than before. Maybe he dyed his hair. He certainly looked sprightlier than when I first met him. You look good today, Dr. Brandt, I said. You must have slept well last night. His eyes brightened. Oh, I did, he said. I swear I feel five years younger this morning. Things were pretty normal for a couple days. The only exception was how many patients passed away. When you work in a nursing home, a certain amount of death is to be expected, but to lose five or six people a week? I began to wonder if old people died in batches. This hardly concerned the other nurses, though. They were too busy discussing the suddenly attractive Dr. Brandt. It seemed that I wasn't the only one who had noticed his change in appearance. Every day he came to work, it seemed like a few more wrinkles disappeared, and his skin 
seemed to have repossessed its youthful elasticity. His hair was now almost completely black. But that was all trivial to me. I had bigger concerns. The pills I took from Sue didn't last long, and it had been at least a day since my last hit. I could already feel the lust for morphine clawing its way back into my brain. There was plenty of medication in the storeroom. I just needed an opportunity to explore it without being noticed. One day, my gaze settled on a red fire alarm down an empty corridor. I casually pulled the alarm, and the building immediately erupted into chaos. Lights flashed up and down every hall, and the alarm system filled the air with a resounding blare. It was so loud that I could feel the vibrations rattle my chest. The corridors filled with panic as the seniors poured out of their respective rooms and trickled towards the exits. Nurses and doctors alike struggled to move the bedridden residents to the nearest elevators. After the mass herd exited the building, I checked the hall leading to the storeroom to make sure it was empty. Just as I was about to reach the storeroom, something caught me off guard. As I was passing room D12, I noticed that the door was left open. An old woman was inside, apparently left behind, and I realized that she was not alone. Dr. Brandt was with her. I squished myself against the wall, afraid that he might notice me. The siren still blared too loudly to hear what was going on, but as I peeked my head around the corner, I could see Dr. Brandt bent over the old woman, his torso convulsed up and down as his face latched onto her neck, feverishly heaving in and out. As he stood up to take a breath, I believe that I saw him wipe off his mouth. The old lady arched her back and squirmed with pain. Her mouth cried out in distress, but the fire alarm drowned out every sound. This seemed to egg him on, and he plunged back in. I didn't know what was going on in there, and I didn't have time to find out. Careful not to be heard, I snuck by Dr. Brandt and made a dash for the storeroom. There were so many cabinets inside it, it would be difficult to find exactly what I was looking for. Like a woman possessed, I swung open every door, rummaging through the various prescription bottles with animalistic fervor. There were lots of blood pressure medication, thyroid stimulants, and all the like, but no morphine. At last, I stumbled across a tiny bottle of methadone. This would have to do. I turned around, ready to leave, but somebody stood in the doorway. It was Dr. Brandt. Agnes, he said. What a surprise. My heart raced a hundred miles an hour. Would I be fired? Would I go to jail? Dr. Brandt casually walked up to me and took the bottle out of my hand. To my astonishment, he twisted off the cap and popped a couple pills into his mouth like M&Ms. I stood there, mouth agape unsure of what to say. Best to clean things up in here. It's an absolute mess, he said. As he was about to exit, he stopped and looked over his shoulder at me. Oh, and Agnes, please check on room D12. In all this excitement, a patient might have died in there. And with that, he left. There was not a single gray hair on his head. The fire alarm was chalked up to the work of a confused resident, and for a time, things returned to normal. I was still on edge about my encounter with Dr. Brandt. I still wasn't sure if he would fire me. We kept our contact to a minimum, until one day, he summoned me into his office. Close the door behind you, he said. I took a seat. Agnes, is there something you'd like to talk about? What do you mean? I said, pretending not to understand. That day in the storeroom, he said. Dr. Brandt, I said, if you're going to let me go, please just get it over with. His face didn't even flinch. Agnes, I think we can help each other out. To my astonishment, he pushed a manila envelope across the desk. There were four or five pictures inside, all of me stealing from the storeroom. I looked at him confused. I'm going to lend you a helping hand, he said. To demonstrate what he meant, I saw him take out a prescription pad and scribble something on it in messy handwriting. With an aggressive flourish, he flicked his pen and tore off the script. For you, he said. I took the piece of paper from him. It was a morphine prescription for 200 milligrams. Why are you doing this? I asked. 
He suddenly grabbed my wrist, and the friendly smile he had shown before was gone. I'll be needing a favor from you in return. I can barely breathe. What kind of favor? I asked. Meet me in the parking lot after work, he said. And if I refuse? I'll turn you in, he answered. So, I was being blackmailed. Dr. Brandt released my hand, and I left as quickly as I could. By the time I walked out to the parking lot, Dr. Brandt was already waiting for me. He leaned against his car, a white BMW, with his arms crossed. You're late, he said. I know, I'm sorry. Nancy was making plans. He just grunted at me. We'll take my car, he said. Opening the passenger door, I asked, Where are we going? Brant didn't answer. We drove without saying a word. I had no idea if we were traveling five minutes or five hours away. It's not like I had a choice anyways. The tall skyscrapers of glass and concrete gradually melted away into quaint suburban cul-de-sacs. White picket fences began to fill up the horizon. Here and there, kids chased dogs around the yard, and fathers pushed their daughters in swing sets. Eventually, suburbia gave way to the countryside. Developed neighborhoods turned into corn rows, and concrete sidewalks were replaced with forests. We were obviously a long way from civilization. I couldn't even remember how long it had been since we passed a house. It seemed that nobody lived out this way. After what seemed like hours, we rolled into some remote town that I don't even know had a name. What could Dr. Brandt possibly want in this place? As if Brandt could hear what I was thinking, he turned the steering wheel end over end and pulled off into a rather dilapidated looking bar. A gaudy neon sign read, Moondance Bar. Brant took the keys out of the ignition and then turned to me. I want you to walk in there, he said, and I want you to go home with a man. I paused, speechless. And then what? I asked. Don't worry about it. I opened the door, but then I saw Brant was still sitting in the car. Are you coming? I asked. No, we can't go in together. So I walked in all by myself. The place looked exactly how I imagined it from the outside. Cigarette smoke filled the air, and an army of alcoholics hunched over their drinks. An old jukebox played Johnny Cash, and some woman I'm fairly sure was a hooker adjusted her skirt. I had barely taken a seat when I heard footsteps behind me. A man in his mid-fifties by the look of it was almost as ugly as his breath smelled bad. You here by yourself? he asked drunkenly. Waiting for a friend, I said. Oh, really? he slurred. Is she pretty? I watched Dr. Brandt sit down at the other end of the bar. Not quite. How about I buy you a drink? he drawled. Dr. Brandt frowned at me. Um, no. No, thank you, I told him, turning my back away. The man muttered something to himself and stumbled off. A couple minutes more and I felt another shadow cast over me. This man was taller than the last one, probably in his early forties, and relatively handsome. Buy you a drink? he asked. Brant nodded his head this time. Sure, I smiled. Two Heinekens, he ordered and took a seat. My name's Jeff, he said. Are you new in town? You could say that. We flirted for a while and then he whispered in my ear. Want to get out of here? Dr. Brandt was already gone. I thought you would never ask. Jeff's apartment was cleaner than I thought. Maybe not spotless, but clean for a man. I barely had time to set my jacket on the chair before Jeff was clambering over every inch of my body. His mind was on one thing, and one thing only. Moving a probing hand away, I backed up a couple feet. Why don't you go upstairs? I suggested. I need to use the bathroom. Down the hall and to the left, he said, giving me a squeeze. I splashed my face in the sink. What had I gotten myself into? I was being blackmailed, and now there was a man upstairs expecting me to sleep with him. Maybe I should just leave, I thought. In fact, that seemed like a great idea. I swung open the door, ready to leave, when something stopped me. 
Dr. Brandt was standing in the doorway. What are you doing here? I asked. He said flatly, you should leave. Brandt looked like a wild animal, pale, vicious, and unpredictable. Everything in his face said that he was a man about to snap. Okay, I said, wedging my way past him. Before I opened the door, I turned back and watched as Dr. Brandt silently walked upstairs to the bedroom. It was eerie how little sound he made, almost as if he were floating on a cloud. I should have left right then, but my curiosity got the better of me, so I crept my way upstairs. The house lights weren't on, so it was difficult to see clearly. Only stray beams of moonlight offered any semblance of visibility. At the top of the stairs, I crooked my head around the corner and saw Dr. Brandt knock on the bedroom door. Light gushed into the hallway from inside, as I heard Jeff's irritated voice demand, Who are you? The last thing I saw was Dr. Brandt's mouth opening so wide that his jaw unhinged from its socket. A set of ghastly fangs sharper than razor wire, stretched out like knives. Faster than what was humanly possible, Brandt lunged inside the bedroom with murderous intent. Nobody said a thing at first. All I could hear was a series of dull thumps banging against the walls. Something sounding of porcelain smashed. A lamp, maybe. And then a dresser or a table crashed to the floor with a loud bang. A sickening snap rang out like gunshot. I tried to tell myself that it was just a broken piece of wood, but deep down I knew that it was somebody's bone. Please! Don't! Jeff's voice pleaded. To my horror, Jeff's bloody arm clawed its way out of the bedroom, dragging his body behind. Jeff managed to pull his entire torso into the hall, and his head tilted towards me with a look of pure terror. Somehow we locked eyes one last time, before I heard a snarl that reminded me of a rabid dog. Dr. Brandt, or whatever he was, sprang out of the bedroom and pounced on Jeff's writhing body. He arched his back, pointing his head to the sky in a warrior pose. His eyes reflected blood red, and I winced when I heard the pop of his jaw dislodging itself to make room for his murderous incisors. The creature tore into Jeff's neck, feasting on his flesh, as Jeff spent the last few minutes of his life screaming in anguish. I ran out of there as fast as I could. A driver happened to be coming down the road at the same time, and I gave him the thumbs-up sign to hitch a ride. What happened to you? The driver asked. Nothing, I said. I called in sick to work the next day, and the next day after that. Should I call the police? Notify the authorities? Of course not, I realized. Not unless I wanted to end up dead. I thought about handing in my notice, or maybe even packing my bags and leaving this place forever. But that wasn't an option. I needed this job, and for more reasons than just money. I had always struggled with addiction, but with the amount of stress I was under, I started to use almost every day. Even with my head in such a fog, I managed to go back to work, and I remember thinking that Dr. Brandt looked really good. I don't mean just good for his age. I mean he looked genuinely good. He looked like he was in his mid-thirties now. Maybe he's on a diet, the other nurses suggested. My interactions with Dr. Brandt were pretty minimal, and for a while, I thought that things might return to normal. I could put the whole experience behind me and forget it ever happened. That was until one afternoon, when Nancy handed me a note with some chicken scratch handwriting. From Dr. Brandt, she said. Nancy raised her eyebrows and walked away. I waited until she was gone and opened the note. Parking lot, 3 p.m., it read. Later I met him outside, just as he asked. I'll drive, he said. Where are we going? I asked. He gave me nothing but silence. I was expecting another long drive out into the country like last time, but as we passed the on-ramp to the highway, I realized that we were staying local this time. We gradually weaved in and out of the capillaries of the city, transitioning from professional office complexes to residential housing developments. One of the neighborhoods we drove through was home to an elementary school, and as I looked out the window, 
I saw the front doors erupt with excited students. A herd of crazed children sprinted out with reckless abandon, some of them running up to the bus stops, while others trekked the streets on foot. I felt the car lurch slightly, as Dr. Brandt put his foot on the brake. A crossing guard, adorned in a neon vest, held up her hand as she ferried a slew of children over the road. Dr. Brandt's impatience was palpable, and as he clenched the steering wheel, his knuckles turned white from the force. His head never moved an inch, but his eyes scanned from side to side, slowly following the children across the street. The crossing guard blew her whistle and signaled us by. Brandt gave her a casual wave and we were off. Not even two blocks away, we pulled over to a side street in a quaint little neighborhood that reminded me of Leave it to Beaver. Brant parked the car, and we sat there, waiting without making conversation. About five minutes later, a couple of girls, maybe nine or ten years old, rounded into view, their backpacks bouncing up and down as they skipped over the sidewalk. Dr. Brant startled me as he shifted the car into gear, and we quietly rolled towards the little kids. What are we doing? I asked. He said nothing, and we rolled even closer. You don't mean... But I couldn't finish the sentence. For the first time since we left the hospital, Dr. Brandt spoke to me. Tell them that their mothers called and asked you to pick them up. My jaw dropped in shock. What? I asked incredulously. They'll trust you, he said. No, no, I can't, I stuttered. This is too much. Brandt scowled at me angrily. Remember our agreement. I thought it was going to be sick. What are you? I demanded. Are you some kind of vampire? He didn't answer me. He just turned his gaze back to the kids with a hungry look in his eyes. I was starting to hyperventilate now, and the pain in my chest felt like a heart attack. I knew whatever the price to be paid, I needed to get away from this man. In a flash, I unbuckled my seatbelt and ripped open the car door. Scrambling outside for dear life, a small resistance tugged at me and then gave away as he tore my shirt. My lungs worked as hard as ever before, and my arms pumped up and down while I bounded across the pavement. I didn't look back until I reached the end of the street, when I realized that I couldn't hear the sound of Brant's car behind me. To my horror, I checked over my shoulder and saw a little girl wearing a red shirt walking over to the passenger side door. Dr. Brant's arm was stretched out the window beckoning the child towards him with a curled finger. The little girl opened up the car door, apparently listening to whatever Dr. Brant was saying. I shouted at her to run away, that he was a dangerous man, and to flee for her life. For a moment, she looked at me with a quizzical expression on her face, as if she couldn't quite hear what I was saying. And then, a hand shot out from inside the vehicle and sucked the poor girl inside. And they were gone, in a second. Later that night, a story was running on the local news about a little girl who was presumed kidnapped. They displayed a picture of her, and I instantly recognized her as one of the little girls I had seen by the school. Olivia Bell was her name. And if you have any information regarding her whereabouts, please contact the authorities immediately, the news anchor instructed. I thought about calling the police, and for a minute... I almost did. At the last second, I decided to hang up the phone. Sure, the police might be able to arrest Dr. Brandt, but what about me? He had all kinds of dirt on me that would put me in prison for a long time. Illicit drugs, stealing prescription medication, and all it would take is one word to put me away. I felt bad for the little girl, but I couldn't let that happen to me. I never expected what happened at work the next day, though. Just when I was about to embark on my morning routine, my supervisor Helen motioned for me to follow her into the hall. What's the matter? I asked. Agnes, I'm going to have to ask you to leave, she said. What? Why? I, I don't understand. The way Helen looked at me kind of reminded me of someone might look at roadkill. You've been placed on administrative leave until further notice. Pack your things and be off site by noon today. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Helen opened the door to show me out. 
but I would not leave without further explanation. Are you saying... Are, are you saying that I'm fired? I asked incredulously. Helen nodded. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. But why? I asked. Why am I being let go? I knew right away that this must be the doing of Dr. Brandt. Almost certainly he had told Helen about my opiate habit in retaliation for what I had done. Helen wrinkled her nose and in a hushed voice answered, Because, Agnes, I can't have a criminal working on my staff. This confirmed my suspicions. Dr. Brandt had ratted me out after all. I didn't even make it ten steps outside the building before a couple of rather intimidating-looking police officers identified themselves to me with their badges. I'm Officer Harris, and this is my partner, Officer Badgley. Are you Agnes Conley? One of them asked. Yes, I answered. The other policeman, Officer Harris, pulled a Polaroid picture out of his pocket and held it up to me. It was the girl that I had seen Dr. Brandt abduct the night before. Have you seen this girl? He asked. I nodded my head, feeling like I was going to pass out. The two officers nodded at each other and pulled out a pair of steel handcuffs. Agnes Conley, Badgley said. You were under arrest for the disappearance of Olivia Bell. It turned out that the officers had received an anonymous tip that I was responsible for kidnapping young Olivia Bell. Of course, I knew that the source of this tip was none other than Dr. Brandt, who was no doubt hoping to frame me for murder. He never needed me to seduce his victims, I realized. He just needed somebody to pin the crime on and remain unseen. The officers had photographic evidence from street cameras placing me near the scene of the crime, which no doubt confirmed their suspicions of me. They asked me all kinds of questions like what I had been doing there that day and whether I had ever seen Olivia Bell before this. I told them I wouldn't answer any questions without a lawyer. After my lawyer arrived, a slick-looking man in his early fifties, he argued that unless the police had some further evidence to indict me, with that, they would have to let me go. And so, much to the officer's disappointment, I was able to walk out that evening. I didn't know what to do. Should I leave the country? I had no job to come back to. That didn't seem like a bad idea. Still, if I fled the country, that would only convince everyone that I had kidnapped Olivia Bell after all. Dr. Brandt would get away with it, and nobody would be any wiser. How many times had he done this before? No, the only way out of this mess was to pin the murder on Dr. Brandt. I had to gather some kind of evidence that I could show to the authorities and prove my innocence. I made one stop home to grab my Polaroid and headed back to the hospital. Of course, I couldn't drive right up to the hospital parking lot since I wasn't supposed to be on site anymore, but I was able to park in the neighborhood across from the rear exit. I was going to have to sit this one out. Minutes and then hours passed by. The sky was a deep salmon color when I first situated myself, but gradually the day gave away to darkness. Milky luminescence covered everything, and a full moon provided enough visibility to see people coming in and out of the facility. At last, I saw a white BMW that I immediately recognized as Dr. Brant's pull out. Careful not to tip him off, I waited a couple seconds before turning on the ignition and pulled out in quiet pursuit. Unlike last time, Brant immediately hopped onto the freeway out of town, and we started our journey past the city past the suburbs, and far into the depths of the countryside. The area he brought me to on our first trip together was certainly desolate, but that place seemed like a metropolis compared to the region we traveled now. Some stretches of road were not even paved with asphalt, and unlike the more populous towns, which had only small patches of forest, the trees here were an overgrown mess. The cornfields were beyond anything I had ever seen, stretching not just a few acres, but as far as the eye could see. Their stalks waved up and down in the nighttime breeze like a sea under the moon. Just then I realized that I was running low on gas. Brant's car took a slow right onto a gravel drive. This was it. I drove on about a quarter mile and pulled off to the side of the road. 
I grabbed my Polaroid and backtracked towards Dr. Brandt's car. As I got closer to the entrance, I could make out a decaying sign. Not all of the paint had finished peeling away yet, and I read the words, Wayne's Auto Repair. Judging by the state of the dilapidated mechanics shop, it looked like Wayne had long since gone out of business. The lot was overrun with a variety of weeds that probably hadn't seen a dose of herbicide in years. I slinked off into the nearby bushes, careful not to be seen. Dr. Brandt was still sitting in his car, in front of the abandoned mechanics shop. Barely a few minutes passed by before I could hear the hum of another engine roaring down the road. In a more populated area, I might have assumed the car belonged to a random passerby, but there could be no such thing as coincidence in an area as remote as this. Sure enough, the sound grew louder, until at last a Chevy pickup truck quietly turned into the same lot. As the mysterious driver parked the vehicle, I watched as Dr. Brandt stepped out into the open. The stranger, a man I judged to be in his forties with greasy brown hair and an unruly beard, followed suit. You've got it? I heard Dr. Brandt ask. Yeah, the man said, lighting a cigarette. I do. Good. I have your payment here. Brandt walked back to his car and withdrew a lumpy-looking bag of what I assumed must have been cash. Fifty thousand, just as we discussed, he said, throwing it at the stranger's feet. The man slowly picked up the bag and rummaged through its contents. He tossed his cigarette aside and looked at Brandt. You know, he slimed, these things are not exactly easy to come by. Perhaps something a little more for the hassle. I couldn't see Dr. Brandt's face in the darkness, but I could tell that he wasn't happy by the way his body stiffened. I thought for sure the man was dead. But to my surprise, Dr. Brandt walked back to his car and procuring yet another bag of cash, tossed it to his associate. Ten thousand more, he said. This seemed to be enough, because the man picked up the bags of cash and took them back to his truck. I craned my neck to see what the man was gathering from the vehicle but even with the moonlight, it was still too dark to see clearly. For what seemed like ages, the man fiddled with something in the passenger side, until finally I watched his silhouette emerge, with what looked to be a basket in hand. I couldn't make out what was in the basket, but when the man came face to face with Brant, I heard him say, I don't ask questions. With that, he handed the basket over to Dr. Brant, and then walked back to his truck, in a second, the hum of his engine roared again, and he reversed course. Brandt stood there for a second, as if to be sure the man was not coming back, and then started walking towards the mechanic shop. With a click and then a swoosh, he swung open the garage door to the mechanics, and emblazoned the property with synthetic light from inside. Just as he was about to close the door behind him, I heard a sound coming from the basket. It was a baby crying. Before I even had time to gasp, Dr. Brandt took the baby carriage inside the garage and closed the door behind him with a deafening slam. Maybe I should call the police, I thought. But the nearest telephone was miles away. No, the authorities were not going to be an option. There was only one thing I could do. I needed to find evidence that could incriminate Brandt. I crept over to his car, careful not to scuffle any pebbles in my path. This was probably the only BMW the Wayne's Auto Repair had ever seen. I kept telling myself not to think about what was happening inside the garage. Just keep focusing on the task at hand, I reminded myself. Snapping a couple pictures of the license plate, I surveyed the vehicle. Surely there must be something I could show to the police. But it wasn't easy to see inside without a flashlight. If only I had thought ahead. The moonlight was enough to see an empty soda can on the passenger seat, and a pine tree air freshener hung from the rearview mirror. Everything else was obscured in shadow. The car doors were probably locked, I realized, but I tried them anyway, on the off chance that Brant had been careless. No such luck. The only chance I had to see the inside of the vehicle was the camera flash from my Polaroid. I took a snap and then watched as, for the briefest moments, the entire car was illuminated. 
Was that something on the floor in the back seat? I checked over my shoulder. Dr. Brandt would be coming back any second now. I took another snap and another flash. There it was again. I was sure of it. One more time. I took a snap, and this time I was able to tell what the thing in the back seat was. There was a small, red shirt crumpled up in the back of the car. A shirt small enough to be a little girl's. Olivia's shirt. How could I get in? The doors were locked, and Brant would be coming outside any second now. A fist-sized rock caught my eye. I was going to have to be quick. I took a deep breath, and then with all the force I could muster, smashed the rear window with a gigantic crunch. Glass shattered in disarray and blood gushed out of my arm as I fished my hand inside. Tom was running out. Bouncing on my tiptoes, I felt soft fabric brush my fingertips, and frantically scooped up the shirt into my fist. Somewhere behind me, the garage door opened again, illuminating the entire lot with sterile light. Dr. Brandt was standing in the doorway, his eyes glowing red, and his mouth smeared with gobs of blood. He hissed menacingly and I made a break for my car. I ran as fast as I could. My lungs burned for oxygen as I sprinted desperately to the roadside, my arms pumping up and down, syncopating with the pounding footsteps of Brant behind me. As fast as I ran, I could tell that he was gaining ground. I managed to make it all the way back to the sign before checking behind me. To my amazement, Dr. Brant was gone. I spun around wildly, trying to see where he could be. He couldn't have just appeared, but there was not a trace of him. Just moments ago, he was practically on top of me. And then I looked up. There was that gigantic silhouette of what used to be Dr. Brandt overhead, his eyes glowing as bright as ever. A sinister pair of wings stretched across the sky above. Just as I craned my neck upwards, he folded his wings and accelerated towards my tiny body like a missile. Every cell in my body screamed after he collided with me. My head slammed into the ground, and all sorts of pastel colors popped in and out of view. He dragged me along the ground a good thirty feet before stopping, scraping the back of my arms over the stone and leaving stray pieces of hair and scalp along the road. Looking up, with his hideous red eyes glowing bright, I watched as his pointy teeth extended from inside his mouth. A gob of saliva dripped onto my face. I tried to struggle away, but his powerful hands pinned me down. To my horror, I heard a popping sound as his jaw opened wide, ready to devour me whole. Please, please don't. I started, but before I could finish, he plunged viciously into my neck, and a whirl of pain exploded over every inch of me. I screamed in agony as he sucked rivers of blood out of my neck. I could feel that with every slurp he took, he was taking a piece of me with it. With every sip, a piece of my vitality, my life, my essence, transferred into him. No amount of kicking and punching could take him off of me. He was far too powerful, and I was growing weaker by the second. My vision started to fade, and I saw the very flesh on my arm start to decay. Like a grape that had been sucked so dry it turns into a raisin. Wrinkles weaved up my hand, and I could feel my body shutting down. I was done for. But then, something unexpected happened. Brant paused, withdrawing his fangs from my neck for a moment, and I thought that he was only gathering himself to make the killing blow. His eyes looked ahead to the horizon, and rather than the bright red rubies they had been just moments before, I watched as they dimmed to a more natural gray. Brant stood up, wobbling off and stumbling over to the side of the road as if he was drunk. He knelt down on all fours and started lurching up and down with a retching noise. Suddenly he made a violent gagging sound and spewed vomit all over the asphalt. He cried out in agony clutching his stomach as he writhed in pain on the ground. A couple times he tried to rise back to his feet, but only wobbled a couple steps forward before dropping back to the ground with a powerful thud. The last thing I ever saw of him was a look of pure hatred, unlike anything I had ever seen. 
in spite of all the people that he had killed, I knew that he hated me the most. At first, I didn't understand what I had done. Surely it couldn't have been any of the punches I had thrown at him. What was so different this time? But then I realized that it was I who poisoned him. He may have drank my blood, yes, but my blood was bad blood. My blood was poisoned to him, tainted by years of drug abuse. As the sun began to rise over the horizon, he stretched his wings wide one last time and flew away into parts unknown. Olivia Bell was never found. And so here I am today, trapped in this nursing home writing my story. I can only hope that if somebody crosses paths with that evil thing again, they can kill him for good. My nurse said that I've had a good run at it, but she hasn't read my story yet. The other day she asked me, Agnes, don't you have a birthday coming up soon? Yes, I answered her. I'll be 27 next month. Draylin fled in the cover of night, the clank of his armor bouncing crudely off the walls of the decrepit stronghold. Tall broken pieces of the misshapen bodies loomed around him like a stone forest. The drunkenness was a veil to his eyes. He knew the path during the day, but now it became a maze seemingly closing in on him. Even so, he couldn't stop. To stop was death. He narrowly managed to avoid a jagged column. The maneuver made him cringe, reminding him of the wound at his side. He gripped at the deep gash in his armor, where beneath it had reached near his ribs. A sharp wheezing tore through the air behind him, sending Draylin's heart into the depths. It was still in pursuit, and worse, drawing nearer. He could hear its claws and rough breathing, the sound of thick rock crumbling with ease in its path. It was eager to taste his flesh. He didn't know how long he could withstand this dwindling chase. Adrenaline filled his veins, but to what extent? He dreaded to think what would happen if, without warning, he stumbled, losing his footing. The world became a blur as he was sent rolling downhill. Each painful tumble mocked his labored body as if taking a turn to spit on his wounds. Finally, he crashed into something hard. More agony emerged from all over. While his mind was still spinning, he felt a cold liquid from his temple. Blood? When he touched the area, he realized it wasn't his own. Instead, a foul smell burned his nostrils, and to his horror saw it belong to a corpse. It was one of his fallen brethren split down the middle like a burlap sack, his innards coating him. There were two more piled near, he opened his mouth to let out a shrill, but a hand clamped over it. Draylin's heart nearly leapt out of his chest. A voice hushed him calmly. His widened eyes were drawn to find a man veiled in shadows. Where had he come from? He glanced further up and realized he had knocked against a rusted door. The sound of the creature's guttural wheezing grew closer. Without hesitation, he was reeled in by the man who quickly slammed the door behind them. The pounding of his pursuer came to a halt. The two men sat in silence, each stifling a heavy breath pumped by fear. They listened as the unholy beast could be heard sniffing the air, searching for its prey. Its breathing was strange, as if struggling to earn it, coiled with fluid and gurgling. Draylin's lungs burned, the air tearing at his mouth for release but he dared not let it go. The claws outside scraped closer, no doubt, drawn by the corpses just a hair's length away. All that separated them from it was the metal door. Might as well have been cloth. Suddenly, a distant rock fell with a clatter. The creature let out another loud wheeze and took off in the distance. Once its pounding faded, Draylin let loose the air, inhaling greedily. The man did the same. That was too close for comfort, Draylin whispered. Thank. The man hushed him again and rose. He walked further back in, gesturing him to follow. Reluctantly, Draylin got up, wincing in the process, and proceeded in tow. 
this area. It was a long corridor built within the mountain. It was tight and run down, filled with broken pots, torn sacks, and other items haphazardly strewn about. He stumbled trying to follow. Hey, he called out into the darkness ahead. Is this place truly safe? Can we trust it to hold? The air was silent except for the moan of the corridor. It stretched ahead, out into seemingly endless darkness. Hello? He called out. Again, silence was returned. Draylon winced as he pushed himself forward. He continued with a hand out, hoping to avoid any further collisions. Finally, the corridor expanded into an open chamber. He could vaguely make out a throne at the center. Tables layered throughout. Draylon flinched as a sudden spark of light appeared in front of him. The man from earlier had lit a torch. Now visible, Draylon studied him in the light. He had a well-built body with tanned skin. His hair was quite dark and lengthy and settled at his shoulders. Leather hide adorned his chest, leaving his arms bare. Draylon noted a bloodied bandage wrapped tightly around one leg. You're a Dyerton, I see, Draylon grunted. He could now see the man's limp as he drew closer. His wild hair fell around his stern eyes. He nodded. My home is in Hossop, but yes, it, it lies in Dyerton, he responded in a strong accent. Draylon smirked. You speak my country's language pretty well, poor barbarian. The man scoffed. How can a man fight alongside his friends without speaking his words? We're not friends, Draylon replied, cringing as he settled against a wall. We just happen to have a common enemy in our lands. Besides, it's worked fine for me. The Dyerton man leaned the torch against the wall and squatted to check on Draylon's wound. Draylon attempted to push his hand away, but received a glare and sat back. The man revealed a small pouch and pinched out what appeared to be dust. What's that? Draylon asked. Something that will help, he replied, spitting into his hand. He lathered the dust until it became pasty. Once satisfied, he applied it to the wound. Draylon scowled at the sharp burn it produced. Easy, he shot. So, what do I call you? Friend? Tyron. Draylon chuckled. Even your names are bloody ridiculous. Name's Draylon. Tyron grunted at the remark. You asked if it was safe. It is, if we do not draw them here. Good to know. So, I take it you're the only survivor of your group, Draylon asked. I saw a few of you lined up before everything went to hell. He nodded solemnly. Many of my brothers were lost. Yeah, same. They're corrupted, cursed creatures. Just one slaughtered ten of us. Can you believe we were proud of that? Of killing one? Then a whole wave of them came through, out of nowhere, overtook us with ease. Makes you wonder what the point even is. The point? My friend, we stood our ground. To challenge them is to prove man will not watch idly and die. Unchecked, it would be our villages and homes. That's a victory. Yeah, Traylon replied. What good is a victory if you're not alive to celebrate? We're alive. But for how long? Look at us. Either can barely walk, let alone fight. Tyron sighed. We must be strong and give our faith into the fates. The fates? Draylon spat to the side. The only thing I'll give them is a piece of my arse. Are the Chuim not strong with the fates in your lands? Tyron asked. Did your enemies not crumble with ease because of Lady Rhoda? Her power fueled your people with good fortune, yes? My people have faith, but not me. I've always made my own luck. The fates never had anything to do with that. Cocksuckers. All of them. Man can only survive on the will of the fates. The will of the fates? Draylon scoffed. You want to see their will? Look out there. It's splayed all over the damn battlefield. 
Was it their will that allowed our brothers to die for nothing? For us to become nothing but fodder? Tyron's eyes fell to the ground. Yeah. That's what I thought, Draylin continued. Out here, you have nothing to trust. Nothing but the men at your side, the blade in your hand, and your wits up here. He said, tapping his temple. Tyron shook his head. I trust Fortuna of strength, just as I trust in all the crowns of fate. I know my faith is being tested, even now. Lady Fortuna's presence is strong in these lands. Perhaps that is why Lady Rhoda abandoned your pe- Screw off already, Draylin interrupted. Just let me be. Tyron nodded and walked over to another part of the wall and sat. Draylin awoke, drenched in sweat. The echo of screams lingered in his mind. He could still see their torn faces frozen in terror and agony. Feel their mutilated bodies pressed up against his. He glanced over to see the low light from the torch and rendered a sigh of relief. He saw a tyrant further down on the wall propped up against it. His head was low as he produced a light snore. Draylin's eyes fell to his wound. Whatever remedy the diaritan had used was clearly working. The bleeding stopped. He slowly rose, still feeling a sharp sting. He grabbed the torch and blew lightly to add life to the flames. Satisfied, he took the time to examine the chamber. It was mostly jagged rock at the ceiling from the mountain, but the stonework began at the walls and made up the flooring. He noted the seals draped. The symbol displayed a wheel with several letters inscribed around it. It was Rhoda of Fortune. Chuim's symbol. The power behind their good fortune. Their fate. The image made his stomach churn. He turned in disgust, noting the tables from earlier, and approached them. They were covered with parchments of the terrain. He saw the stronghold's position with toppled pieces, representing their forces. Tracing the map, he saw where the enemy had been annotated. The gate. He didn't realize how close they were to it. Draylin had been among the third line of defense. The last was the sixth. Beyond that was the captain's position. At that moment, his eyes sparked. Where was the captain? Or the other guard sergeants? If this was their last stand, shouldn't the remains be about? They would have clearly been seen, or better yet, smelt by now. He recalled the bodies he had seen near the door. Was that them? Possibly, but he didn't recollect the captain among them. That had to at least be the guard sergeants. If he wasn't dead out there, and he wasn't inside here, then... His eyes traced the map. Immediately they grew wider. There was a back way, an escape route. Bastard, he whispered under his breath. He hobbled as fast as he could around the chamber as he scanned the area. Where was it? It appeared to be one solid room except for the entrance. The mess of pots and crates spilled into this space as well. It had to be here. He settled on the large throne at the center. Couldn't be, he whispered. He approached it with haste. It was made of stone, partly cracked but for the most part in good shape. He could picture the captain in the chair, fancying himself over the others, as they argued over strategy. Being the captain, he wouldn't privy anyone else's seat in it. That was the type of man he was. Draylin studied the chair with his fingers, combing every inch. The captain wasn't the type to place himself in a hole, trapped. Not without having his finger gray something extending under the armrest. A backup plan. He pressed it, and a deep rumbling filled the air. A gust rushed out from the back of the throne. He coughed and glanced back to see a square opening in the ground. The torch revealed a set of stairs descending. He found it. What are you doing? Tyron said suddenly. His voice startled Draylin. What is this? Tyron asked. What did you do? Don't you see, my friend? Draylin said excitedly. It's a way out. We can get out of this bloody place. Tyron shook his head backing away. No, 
This is not good. We cannot go down there. Draylin gave him a look of disbelief. Are you mad, Dyerton? Don't you want to get out of here? Don't you want to leave? I do. But this is not the way. Really? And what's your plan, then? We wait. Draylin scoffed. Please tell me, you chest. That's it? That's your plan? To sit and do nothing? Yes. So, you're, you're giving in, then? No. Does your plan include food? Because we don't have any, or water, unless you count that magic dust, we'll die down here. I leave our well-being to the fates. Lady Fortuda will deliver us. Draylin rolled his eyes. Not this damn thing again. Why does you and everyone cling to these damn fates? He yelled. Tyron recoiled. The real question, he began, is why do you not? Draylin scoffed again. What does it matter? Tell me, he pressed. Draylin sighed, running his hand over his shaven hair. I can never understand it, he started. How people can worship them. How can you put trust in beings who do nothing in return? You said you put your hope in the crowns, right? The man nodded. Funny. Everyone is so quick to kiss their arse but seemed to forget about her. The one who turned her damn back on us. He was now in the face of Tyron. Fancied herself the title queen and created those unholy bastards to wage war on everything that has bloody meaning. The same unholy beasts that ransacked our lands, fed on our light, our hope. He choked on his words. Our wives and our... and our children... He stopped to wipe his eyes. You cannot blame the action of one on the many, Tyron stated. Really? Draylin replied. Are the others any different? What have they done to right this wrong? It was one of their own damn kind in the first place. And what have they done? Nothing. Instead, we have to fend for ourselves, dying by the thousands. They're no better than that wench. And the musks, like you still pray to them... He paused to collect himself. The fates have been nothing but a thorn in mankind's arse since the dawning. Only blind sheep keep on trusting them, not me. Because I know what you'll get in return if you do. Silence, suffering, death. Cocksuckers. That's what I think of the damn fates. They can eat mine and some. Tyron was speechless. For a long minute, the burning of the torch filled the void in the air. I'm sorry, Tyron finally spoke. You have clearly suffered loss. I understand your pain. I too have lost my family, my wife, and two sons. I thought Lady Fortuna wanted, wanted me to use my anger to harness her strength. But I, but I was wrong. The truth, I... I I am a coward. I rushed into battle and found I was afraid. When the darkness attacked, I fled. I left my brothers to die. He paused. This is why I must atone. I believe this is my test. To listen. To wait. That is Fortuna's true power. True strength is patience. We must wait. He placed a hand on Draylin's shoulder but it was pushed away. A tone on your own, Draylin stated coldly. You can stay here. I want to live. No, I cannot let you leave, Tyrant stated. Huh, let me leave? You may draw them here. It is a risk. We must wait patiently. We cannot go against the will of the fates. To do so is death. Draylin threw a punch into the Dyerton's face. It felt like he had struck a wall. Still, the blow managed to catch the large brood off guard. It wasn't enough, though, as the man quickly retaliated with a backhand that sent Draylin flying to the ground. The torch fell from his hands, rolling into a flurry of light. Never go against the will of the fates, Tyron said, as he slowly approached Draylin. Draylin's ears were ringing. A sharp pain pulsed from his lip. He looked to see Tyron reaching for him. 
Quickly, he launched a dirty kick to his groin. The giant howled in pain, toppling to the ground. Draylon took advantage, mounting him, and rained down heavy blows to his face. Here's what I think of your cock-sucking fates. Don't you understand, you bloody lout? We need to get out of here while we can. Tyron reeled his hands free to grab his attacker by the shoulders and rendered a headbutt. Draylon's vision became a flash of black and white. He moaned in agony, rolling over while gripping his head. It felt like he had rammed it against ten metal doors and some. He braced for another blow, but it never came. He glanced up and saw Tyron standing over him. What was he waiting for? This was his chance. Draylon's vision finally cleared. In the torchlight, he noticed the man's eyes were not on him, but beyond. He could see the fear in them. That's when he heard it. A guttural wheezing. Immediately, Draylon's eyes shot toward the corridor bathed in shadows. He could hear the clank of pots crunching and sacks being slid. It was one of them. Their scuffle must have drawn it inside. He quickly scanned the room, noting a fallen table. Take cover, quick, he whispered to Tyron. Tyron nodded and scanned the area, until settling behind some crates. Draylon made his way to the table. Just as he knelt behind it, the wheezing grew louder. It had reached the chamber. He swallowed hard. They were trapped. The torch teased its irregular figure on the walls. He listened as its heavy steps brought it further in. A foul smell accompanied it. It was beyond rancid, like sour fish bathing in crap. No doubt a blend between its own odor and its banquet of flesh. It was hard to tell which he'd prefer over the other. Regardless, he choked back a wave of bile that reached his throat. The creature navigated aimlessly. Draylon peeked around the table to catch a glimpse of its tar-like skin as it began to turn his way. He quickly reeled back. What was their next move? It wasn't a big area for it to move around in, or for them either. He could hear it make its approach to his side. His heart pounded like a madman. He was sure it could be hurt against his armor. Draylon noted a crate nearby and realized he had no choice. If he didn't try for it, he'd be spotted anyway. He took a few deep breaths and crawled. He fought to keep his armor from clanking, but that was easier in his mind. The creature continued to stir around in the background. Finally, just as he reached the crate, his foot scraped. It growled and shot for the table. He could hear it launch it without effort, causing it to splinter. Draylon fought to stifle his breathing as it combed the area. It turned his attention to the air, sniffing once again. Draylon attempted to find another sliver of salvation. He knew his options were waning. His eyes landed on Tyron, still safe behind his own crate. His gaze was clearly on the creature, until they locked onto his. Draylon could hear the wheezing morph into another growl. It realized their presence. His eyes fell upon the throne. The escape path. How could he have forgotten about it? The claws started to make a beeline on his position. Could he make it to the hole? Even if he did, would he be able to outrun it if it followed him down? Suddenly an idea dawned on him. He had little time to dwell on its success. His gaze met Tyron's again and rendered a nod to him which puzzled the man. Instantly, Draylon took off. The creature let out an ear-piercing wheeze that became a howl. Dyerton! Draylon shouted. Follow my lead! Now! The creature launched itself with an insane speed. Draylon narrowly dodged it, throwing himself to the side as it slammed into the crate. Its momentum sent it into a wild roll, barreling into the wall. Large chunks of rocks were sent hurtling. Without hesitation, Draylon grabbed the torch. Tyron appeared behind him. What's your plan? he asked. That dust, you have any more? The creature finally recovered. It moved with a sickening crack, turning its form in their direction. Its fluid-like wheeze eased into another growl. Tyron's fingers fumbled to reel out his pouch. Hurry, Draylon hissed. It's coming again. Tyron tore open the sack, pinching out the dust. The creature posed itself for another pounce. 
Tyron threw the dust onto the torch, sparking the flames to leap out just as it started to move. Instantly, it halted in its tracks, roaring from the brightness. Draylin held the fire out, waving it to keep it at bay. The creature wheezed in contempt, pacing and backing off with each wave. What now? Tyron asked over his shoulder. That flame's strength won't last long. I'm aware of that, Draylin retorted without taking his eyes away. Now in the light, the abomination could be fully seen. Its body was large, rivaling a horse. Its shape was off-putting to say the least. It was obese in some areas, coated thick with a web of veins, yet muscular in others, mainly from its beefy arms. Its head shrank deep into its torso, absent in neck. It was hard to believe it once had been a person. The eyes were embedded deep into its sockets, which accented its skull seemingly on the verge of tearing through its skin. Draylin noted the golden hilt of the sword wedged in its back, the one he lost after it clawed him. Didn't think we'd meet again so soon, he said under his breath. Its mouth was like a crater, stretching down to its chest. It rendered another wheeze, revealing the intricate rows of daggers. Draylin noted the flames dwindle. Give me the rest of the dust, he said, reaching a hand back. What are you? Just give it and head towards the throne. Be ready. On my mark, move out of the way. Reluctantly, Tyron obliged. Once in hand, Draylin slowly backed up. The creature began to make stronger advances as the flame got lower. Draylin tore the bag with his teeth and began dumping it on the ground. All right, be ready he whispered. He hoped this worked. The flame finally settled into low embers. At that, the creature growled deeply. Now! Draylin screamed. He threw the torch down at the dust just as it launched itself. Once again, he narrowly evaded. The dust ignited into a bright blaze, stunning the creature as it propelled into the wall. It fell to the ground, thrashing blindly. Small bushes of fire still lapped at its skin. Draylin didn't waste time and quickly bolted to it. He ducked, avoiding an arm it swung. His eyes were on the prize, the sword wedged in it. He attempted to reach it, but was forced to evade another wild swing. Finally, he found an opening and jumped for it. The handle was still hot, singeing his flesh. But he held on, pulling with all his strength. The creature shook violently, throwing him off. Draylin hit the ground hard, yet he glanced at his hand with the sword in it and smiled. The creature released another loud wheeze. This pulled him from his minor triumphant. It wasn't over yet. He found his legs and made his way near it. Over here, you bloody bastard, he yelled, clanking the sword on the ground. Don't you want to finish the job? It quickly turned its head towards him. He could see its eyes were charred over. He hit the sword harder. That's it. Come on. It growled again and scrambled with haste towards him, hatred boiling for him. Perfect, Draylin thought. The creature stumbled, nearly falling completely into the open trap door. Its torso was halfway through, but it managed to catch itself with one arm. Draylin swiftly closed the distance and rammed the sword deep into its head from behind. It cried out in agony, but it didn't die. It kept thrashing, fighting to pull itself up. He struggled to keep its body pinned. He could feel the beast's resistance increase. At the corner of his eye, he noticed Tyron watching. Dyerton, he screamed to him. Help me hold it. The man was frozen, his gaze full of terror. Dyerton, I cannot hold this beast alone. Draylin could feel the blade tearing through its flesh, providing more leverage to the creature. Tyron! This pulled the man's eyes finally on him. Help me, damn it! The man sprang into action, his hands wrapped around the sword, pushing it down with greater force. Hold it! Draylin ordered, releasing his own grip. Tyron nodded but struggled to hold it steady. Even with his strength, the creature was too much. Draylin rushed over to the throne. His fingers fumbled for the switch until he found it, impressed. The door rumbled with life and began closing. However, the creature stopped it with its brace hand. Cut it! Draylin yelled, 
Hurry and cut the damn thing. Tyron yanked the sword up and began hacking away at its arm. Each blow slowly ate at the flesh, accompanied by an anguished squeal from its owner. Finally, he rendered the final blow. The door slammed shut, cutting off its whimpering head. Draylon sighed in relief. His heart was beating at full steam. He fell to his knees. They did it. Tyron began laughing uncontrollably and fell to his back. What's so funny? Draylon asked. Don't you see, friend? That was my test. This was a step to cure me of my cowardice. And I succeeded. I faced the darkness. Draylon chuckled a bit, finding his footing. You see, Tyron continued. I was patient all these years, and Lady Fortuna came through. They are for mankind. This is the reason, my friend, why we must wait here. Salvation will find us in due time. To go against the fates is death. Tyron attempted to rise, but winced in pain. He chuckled. My friend, he said, holding out a hand. Can you help me up? I'm sore. Draylon's footsteps carried over to him. Tyron waited with a smile. However, it soon faded when he heard grunting. What? Dr Draylon? Wh what are... He started to ask, but before he could finish, Draylon slammed a large chunk of rock onto his head. A loud crunch filled the air. The Diretan's body twitched erratically. Draylon cringed as he lifted the now bloodied rock up once more, slamming it again. Tyron stopped flinching. Sorry, friend, Draylon said through heavy breaths, but I'll wait no more, especially for one of those things to return. He hobbled to his feet and made his way to the throne again. He pressed the button to open the trap door. The creature's body tumbled through, cracking as it descended the stairs. Draylon chuckled. He took a moment to compose himself. However, a noise threw his heart back into the depths. Footsteps. They came from below. It was still alive. But how? Frantic, his eyes scanned the area for something to grab. He noted the sword near Tyron, but the shadow of the beast was emerging too quickly. He grabbed the first thing next to him, a rock, and held it up. As it emerged, Draylon stood in awe. The rock fell from his hands. It was... The captain... The nobleman was a sight for sore eyes. He had rounded features with a face plastered with fatigue. The tall man donned red armor without a blemish, decorated with a white cape. Captain Waller, Draylon said. The man produced a warm smile. Soldier, I'm surprised you managed to survive. It, it wasn't easy, sir. Draylon made a chest salute. Tears formed in his eyes. I'm so glad you made it, sir. Captain Waller nodded. Carry on. Draylon wiped his eyes. Are you the only one left? The captain asked. I am, sir. It was only me and that Diarton. Captain Waller glanced over to Tyron's body. He noticed the sword and picked it up. Well, it's all over now, son. Rest assured. Draylon approached the trap door. Are reinforcements down here, sir? Are they down? His words were cut short. He glanced down and saw the bloody tip of the sword through his stomach. Ooh. Sorry, lad, Captain Waller said softly. Can't have word out how I abandoned my men to die for my own survival. To think. This hole was a blessing and a curse. The path out had long caved in and I was trapped. However, Lady Rhoda smiled on me when she sent you here. He reeled out the blade. Draylon coughed out blood. He fell forward, passing through the hole. He plunged, feeling every crunch of the stairs along the way. Captain Waller wiped the blood off the sword. Immediately after, a loud thunder erupt from the corridor. A group of soldiers stormed the chamber with swords out. They halted upon seeing him. Sir! One of the men stated, producing a salute that sparked a ripple from the others. Reinforcements have arrived. Are you hurt? Captain Waller waved them at ease. I'm fine, Lieutenant. Perfect timing. Are you the only survivor, sir? 
Captain Waller paused to glance back at the trap door. Yes. No others made it, I'm afraid. Let us leave this place. I've been without fresh air for too long. Yes, sir. Everyone fall back. As the horde exited, Captain Waller noted the sound of metal still lingering in the air. It was accompanied by grunting and coughing. He turned and realized it came from the trap door. He sighed and walked to the throne and pressed the button to seal the door.